have talent budding all over the place but Dan it's just like you said she's done it just like you taught her that was beautiful ladies thank you take your Bibles tonight and let's look over at the book of Hebrews chapter 11 just a verse for a text Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 a very familiar verse with everybody Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 6 when you find your place let's stand and we'll read this verse of scripture Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, the Bible says, But without what? Faith. Faith. It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Father, again tonight, we're thankful for our church. We're thankful for our people. Thankful for those that are willing to use their, their musical talent for God's glory. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, encourage us tonight, challenge us, that we might be a people of real, true faith. And Lord, we just ask you to save any loss that might be here tonight or Christians that are struggling. I pray tonight they would draw closer to you than ever before. And we're going to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak, you may be seated. I want to speak tonight on this subject, faith for the voyage. Amen. And you say, well, we're not on the sea. Well, the passage of Scripture we're going to look at is talking about the sea. Amen. Look over at Luke chapter 8, if you would. And we're going to look at a story that Jesus gave, and he gave it about his disciples, but I think it so often applies to you and I, the principles that are seen in this portion of Scripture. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 22, it says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. Now, that phrase in verse number 22 is the key of everything. Jesus said, let us go over onto the other side of the lake. Now, you think about that, and as we go along, we'll see that, what I'm talking about. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the wind and the water, and they obey him. You know, our voyage in this Christian life, it's got its ups and downs. I mean, I don't know who you are here tonight or what you've gone through, but I know you've had ups and downs because everybody does. That's just the way it is in life. And we'll have trials, we'll have storms. But here's the thing, these trials and the ups and downs, they should never stop us if we have what? Faith, but if we have the right kind of faith. Yeah, and we're going to see that tonight. Some would say this, I, I put my faith in my family, and here's why they do that, because they're always there for me. They're always there for me. Uh, while others might say I put my faith in my job because it supplies all the needs I have. Also, there might be those that would say, I, I put all my faith in my money because that gives me a sense of security. And then there are those that would say this, I put my faith in my ability and my experience, and because of that, I can handle any situation that comes along. That is not what God had in mind, and that is not God's plan. Look over, if you would, at Mark chapter 11, and let's look at verse 20 down to verse number 23. And we'll see exactly what God has in mind. In Mark chapter 11 and verse number 20, the Bible says this, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw a fig tree dried up from the roots. You remember that story? He saw the leaves on the fig tree, and what did the Lord Jesus figure? If the leaves are on that fig tree, then there's got to be what? Fruit. And because there was no fruit, what did he do? He condemned that tree. And Peter calling to remember and saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, what is the next few words? It says what? Have faith in your ability. Have faith in your finances. Have faith in your family. Have faith in your job. Is that what it says? No, God's way is have faith in him. Amen. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto the mount, this mountain, 
Be thou removed and thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now you think about that. You say, there's no way. No way I have enough faith that I could say to a mountain, be removed. The Bible says if we had the faith of a what? Grain of a mustard seed. Now I don't, I think I've seen them, but a mustard seed is a little tiny thing. That's not a lot of faith. So what does that tell you about the average Christian? What kind of faith do we have? It's not great faith, amen? Now, there's nothing in the Scripture that ever tells us to put our faith in anything but the Lord. Not one place you'll ever find that. It doesn't say about our finances or our abilities. It doesn't. But this text that we're going to look at tonight, I think it paints a picture of exactly what the Lord was talking about and also tells us what human nature is like. Uh, I, I want you to look also, if you would, at... Uh, well, hang on. Let me, get, let me get ahead of myself. If we don't put our faith in the Lord for this voyage in life, guess what? We're going to have an uncomfortable life. There's no question about that. Remember the Lord said to them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. You know, when the Lord says something, what should we do? We should trust Him and we should our pay, put our faith totally in that. Now, I'm going to give you some info, and I thought this was very interesting, and that's why I'm going to read it to you. The lake was the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Kinnereth in Numbers 34 and Joshua 12, the Lake of Gennesaret in Luke 5, and the Sea of Tiberias in John chapter 6. The lake is set in the hills of northern Israel, the Sea of Galilee nearly 700 feet below sea level, making it the lowest freshwater lake on the earth and the second lowest lake in the world. It's approximately eight miles wide in its widest point and more than 12 miles long from north to south. It places the, in places the sea plunges to the depths of 200 feet and its fresh water supply comes primarily from the Jordan River. Around the sea, the hills of Galilee reach nearly 1,400 feet above sea level. The mountains of the Golan Heights uh, reach more than 2,500 feet. The slopes of the Golan Heights on the east and Mount Arbel on the west drop sharply down to the sea. Now you say, what's that all got to do with anything? Well, it's got to do with the conditions of this, this body of water. Because of the sea's location, it's subject to sudden and violent storms as the winds come over the eastern mountains and drop suddenly under the sea. Storms are especially likely when the east wind blows cool air over the warm air that covers the sea. This sudden change can produce surprisingly furious storms in a very short time as it did in Luke chapter 8. When I was a boy, we had a place on a lake in Wisconsin. And this lake was not very deep. You could be out there on a sunny day, the clouds would come up, the wind would come up, and you'd have four and five foot waves just that fast. And that's basically what happened in this situation. And the Lord asked His disciples where their faith was, and we need to answer that question tonight too. Where is our faith? Amen. Is our faith in the family? Is our faith in our job? Is our faith in our ability? Is it in our finances? Or is our faith in God as Jesus made the comment? Right. Because without faith, it's absolutely impossible to please Him. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Without faith, we'll never have any victory. Faith is the victory. Isn't there a song like that? Faith is the victory. But look there at John chapter, 1 John 5 and verse 4, and it says very clearly there, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the what? Victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now I want to look at the components of this situation as they were at the sea I want to look first off at the sailors. What can we learn from these sailors? And they paint a pretty vivid picture of themselves and their condition. If you'll notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18 and verse number 21. Matthew 4 verse 18. And again, it's talking about the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. In verse 18 it says, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren... Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Now, verse 21, it gives some, some other names. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Debedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Now, in these two verses, we see at least four of those disciples who were sailors. They were seamen. 
And they knew the sea, especially this particular one, because they sailed on it all the time. And for them, the request to launch out and go to the other side of the lake was not an unusual comment or was not an, an unusual request. Here's the thing, though. Even though these men were seasoned sailors and they understood the sailing and they had experience and they had survived many of the storms probably that came across on that sea, this time they were at their wit's end and they did not know what to do. So what is that telling you? It's telling you men that had experience, they had, they had been through it all, that they could not trust in that in their life. Look at Psalms 107 and look at verse number 23 through 29. Psalms 107 and verse 23 through 29, it's describing this also in the book of Psalms. In verse 23, it says, They that go down to the sea in ships do business in great waters. I noticed right there where it says they do business. You know what that tells me? They were at sea all the time. This was their business. This is what they knew. This is what they were capable of. And then it goes on. Uh, these see the works of the Lord and His wanders in the deep. And I thought about that. Yep, they're businessmen. They go out to the sea and they have seen all that God could do. But yet in this situation, you know what they trusted? They tried to trust themselves. And then verse 25, it says, For He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof, they mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their what? Wits end. But notice this, it says then, and only then, when they get to their wits end, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He bringeth them out of their distresses, He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. You know what? Their faith prior to that had been misplaced. And I wonder how many times our faith is misplaced. Uh, we're out on the sea of life and we're on this voyage of life and we think that we can handle everything. And most of the time, our faith is misplaced because it's in ourself or somebody else and it's not in the Lord. And I think about in the midst of the chaos, they forgot the Lord. And, and he said unto them, remember these words, he said, let us go unto the other side of the lake. Right there is where the faith should have been. If Jesus said, we're going to the other side and I'm going with you, guess what you're going to do? Amen. You're going to make it to the other side. But how often do we forget that? How often do we forget the words just as he gave to the disciples? Uh, he said, I will never leave thee and I will never forsake thee. He never will. So why, why do we struggle on this voyage of life as a Christian and we get into the different, different situations and we try to handle it ourselves and most of the time it's with a disastrous result? We ought to realize that our God is the only one. Realize that the faith they had in their ability in the experience that they had was not going to help them at this time. And you and I might get through a little bit in life. But there are going to come times in our life we're going to be just like these seamen and we thank the family, we rush to the family, or we rush and we go to our finances or our ability and the next thing you know, we're struggling and we're failing. Why? Because we're not putting our faith where the faith needs to be. Amen. And you think about when the disciples said, Master, Master, we perish. You know what they're really saying? We're going to, we're going to perish in spite of our efforts that we've put forth, we thought we could get this done, but we can't. Sometimes it takes a real, a real setback in our life for us to come to the point where we acknowledge that and admit it. And I think something else, they were questioning the promises of God. If God gives us a promise in His Word, what do we do? Do we sit back and contemplate that and say, I wonder if it's really true or will it really come to pass? That's what they were doing. They were questioning the teaching and the parables and everything that the Lord Jesus had given to them. But here's the thing. To their credit, when they got to their wit's end, they didn't just stand and fail. They ran to the one that could help. And we need to do that. But why not do it before? Why not realize that everything we do in life and this voyage we're on, if we're going to be successful and we're going to make it, that we got to put our faith in God and Him alone. Our abilities and our experience is not the place to put our faith, but it's in the Lord Jesus. I think we can learn from those, those seamen and those sailors 
that we need to put all our faith in, in the Lord Jesus at all times about absolutely everything. But then look, if you would, at something else. I want you to think about the ship. You say, what do you mean the ship? Well, from all indications, as you read the scriptures, the ship was very seaworthy, and that wasn't even the issue. The question was not the reliability of the ship, nor whether or not it could make it through the storm uh, and be successful. That wasn't about the ship. What was important was this. It was who was on the ship. Amen? Uh, Who was on the ship? It was the Lord Jesus. It, It wasn't just the seamen. But he was on board, and he was the master of what, the Bible says. He's the master of the sea. He's the master of everything. And the secret to surviving any storm in our life is to have Jesus on board. Amen? Amen? I think as we look around at the circumstances and the events of the world we live in right now, I don't know how you are, but I'm weaning myself off of the news. You say you are? Yeah, because every time I look at it, I want to throw up. Amen? I mean, here our government is, we, we had our border shut down and things were going pretty good. Now they're sneaking them in, they're flying them on airplanes and buses in the middle of the night and nobody ever knows what's going on. And you know what? A lot of people think this is the ship they need to stay on. America is sinking, folks. America is going down and we better not put our faith and our trust in a ship that's sinking. Whether it be the country we live in, and don't get me wrong, I love America. I'm American from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. But our country's in trouble. And our government's in trouble. Amen? And we cannot put our faith in a country and a government that's anti-God and turning their back on God. We can't. It's impossible. Look at Psalm chapter 2. And look at verse 1 through 12. The ship we need to be on is the ship the Lord Jesus is on. Look at there at Psalm 2 and verse number 1. It says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And this describes right now to me what's going on in America and the world. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to take counsel together, what? Against the Lord and against His anointed saying. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. I don't care how hard the world tries, they're never going to defeat the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. And the sooner they could get that into their minds and they could see the truth, our nation would turn around, the world would turn around, it would be a whole lot better place to live. It says in verse 4, And he that sitteth in the heavens shall what? Laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Why in the world do we have to go through punishment? Why do people have to be disciplined when there's no need for it if we just put our faith in the right place? Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them of the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now look at verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O you kings, and be instructed, ye judges of the earth. You know, God, I believe, and I've said this every week probably when I preach, I believe what's going on today is an absolute result of prayer. We've asked God to bring revival to America, and the only way God's going to bring revival is to bring America to its knees to where it realizes what's going on and the wrong that's going on, and their eyes would be open. And right there he says, O ye kings and O judges of the earth, serve the Lord with what? Fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish from the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their what? Trust in Him. You know that word trust, it literally means this. Confidence or firm belief and the reliability and truth of something or somebody. And I don't know about you, I know the one I want to put all my faith and trust in. And it's not the ship we're riding on today in America, but it's on another ship. We can't trust the vessels of this world, but we can trust the old ship of Zion. You remember this song, Ship Ahoy? I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea. And the angry ways threatened my ruin to be. When away at my side, I dimly decried. A stately old vessel and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy, 
ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, ship ahoy. Was the old ship of Zion thus sailing along, all aboard her seemed joyous. I heard their sweet song, and the captain's kind ear, ever ready to hear, caught my way cried out in fear, ship ahoy, ship ahoy. As I cried out in fear, ship ahoy. Then the good captain commanded a boat to be lowered, and with tender compassion me, he took me on board. And I am happy today, all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior. And now I can say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, for from my soul can I say, bless the Lord. O soul sinking down neath sin's merciless waves, the strong arm of the captain is mighty to save. Then trust him today, no longer delay, board the old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout and sing on your way, Jesus saves. I don't know about you, that's ship I want on. Amen? You say, well, that's talking about salvation. I think that talks about any kind of distress, whether it's a lost soul headed to a lake of fire or it's a saved Christian that's going through a storm in life. He's the ship we want to be on, and we want him on board. Amen. But then look also, if you would, we've seen the sailors couldn't, couldn't trust their experience and their knowledge. The ship, you had to be on the right ship. The master of the ship had to be with you. But then there's the storm. It must have been a real wild storm, to say the least. Amen? Uh, because of the day, uh, the, day and, uh, the day they were out in the lay of the land, the storm could, could happen very often. Because if you can picture the mountains coming up and the cold air dropping down and hip, hitting that warm, what, caused, what has happened here in Missouri with that? Tornadoes. That's pretty violent storms. Amen? But they happen often. And on this particular day, the storm was worse than it had ever been in the past. In order for them to remain afloat, the water, here's a good one. This is just basic fundamentals. The water needed to stay in the ocean and not in the boat. Amen? But the Bible says, the scripture says, they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. This, these disciples, again, remember, they were experienced sailors. They had handled similar storms, uh, but this was totally different than anything they'd seen. They literally feared for their lives and, and what, what was the problem? The last resort, and why is it always the last resort? They cried, Master. Yeah. Amen. In the middle of the storm, they saw the storm. They knew it was out of hand. They tried to handle it by themselves. But then finally, when they got to their what? Wits end, they cried, Master. Right. I wonder why that's the way we do it. Why is it we, we struggle and we try and we determine we can handle it on our own and we go and we go and we go and the next thing you know, we're failing. And then at the last, we finally call out, and say, Master, please help. And I think about that he came immediately. Amen? Calmed the storm, took care of absolutely everything. And I think about this. How many times do we wait in the storm? The storm is just a little storm, just a thunderstorm in life. But you know what? He wants us to call on him in that thunderstorm. He doesn't want us to wait till it becomes a hurricane or a, a tornado or something even worse. He wants us to call on him at all times and put our faith in him for the little tiny things, not just the big things. We've got to call on the master of the sea because what he'll do is he'll rebuke the wind and the waves and calm our lives just like he did with those that were in that ship. I think about how the no matter the magnitude, big or small, he is able to take care of our needs. But then look at this last thing. And I want you to see, we've seen the sailors. They realized they could not handle it in their experience and their ability. They realized the ship was not the problem mainly. It was who was in the ship, and that was Jesus. But the ship is something that's important. Don't put all your eggs in the basket of this world. Don't all put all your eggs in the government of our country. We got to put all our eggs in the basket of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And then the storm. I mean, the storm was violent. And you and I may go through some violence in our lives, but let me say this, that Jesus Christ is the master of the storm, and he can bring the worst to an end and bring victory. But then I want you to think about the last thing, and that was the Savior. In Luke chapter 8, we read of Christ's involvement but I don't believe we see him today as the disciples saw him at that time. Although they were in a state of panic and they were in a state of despair, the storm did not disturb the Lord Jesus. In fact, what does the Bible say he was doing? 
He was asleep. So you say, well, my storms, I just don't want to bring it to him. Hey, listen, he's been through everything there is on the face of this earth. And I wonder what caused him to wake up. It wasn't the storm. Do you know what it was? It was the unbelief of those disciples when they came to him and they said, Master, Master! Amen. The storms and trials of our life are not something that disturb the Lord because he's in control of it. After the Lord Jesus calmed that storm, the disciples saw him in a totally, totally different light. They had witnessed, I think, for the whole time of his ministry. They saw him perform miracles, and they saw him do things that that nobody else could do. But that day, as he calmed the storm on the sea, they realized that he was not just a prophet, but he was in control of everything. And do we have to go through a terrible time or a terrible storm or disaster in our life to get our eyes open to reality of who he is? He's in control of it all. Now, in here tonight, we have, we have great folks in our church, I believe that, but I'm going to include myself in this. I don't think we see him like the disciples see him. We don't see him as the one that can take every situation, no matter how bad, how serious it is, and he can make it right. Amen. But they saw him through an entirely, entirely different light. And I think most of the time, the heart of the problem is this. It's no godly fear. Now, godly fear is not that fear of somebody sticking a gun in your back and saying, I'm going to take your money or give me your money or I'm going to shoot you. That's not it. It's the reverence and respect that God deserves. And look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. God requires that we fear him. That's a, that's a requirement. It's not an option. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, the Bible says this, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? The very first thing, what is it? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in, what's that next little word? Uh, you ought to circle that because it means exactly what it says. To walk in all his ways and to what? Love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart and with all thy soul. Fear was the very first thing, the reverence and respect of God. We say we love God, we say we respect God, but do we really, when it comes down to when the problems come in our life, do we try to handle it ourselves or do we give it to Him immediately? Right. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. I read the book of Ecclesiastes every day. Every day. I go through it every month, go through it over and over. You say, why is that? Because Solomon poured out his heart in the book of Ecclesiastes. I really believe that. Uh, he saw that fearing God was the duty. Solomon saw that, and he wrote about that in chapter 12 and verse 13 of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the very last verse in the book of Ecclesiastes. And look what he says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What does he say? What's the very first thing? Fear God and keep his what? Commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And then Matthew 10, 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Folks, the disciples saw something about their Savior they'd never seen before, and I believe the respect level went to the highest it could go. Our nation and our government, folks, and it's terrible to say it, but it's in a reprobate state. What the United States of America has done, they've abandoned God for sin. You say, well, that's pretty brutal, but isn't that exactly what's happened? They've turned away from God and all the things that God hates and everything that God calls an abomination, that's what they're putting in and that's what they're, they're, they're pushing it. Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient to every good work reprobate. It sounds like the day and age we live. Without godly fear, we ride the rough seas of life alone, and we do ride it alone. Just as the Lord used this storm in the lives of the disciples to produce godly fear and godly faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He wants to do the same thing in our lives. God wants us to work in our lives and through our lives. He doesn't want to be trouble in our lives. You know what He wants to do? He wants to give us a better life. Amen. I wonder tonight... 
Maybe you say, well, my situation is terrible. You need to remember that God is greater than the situation. You say, well, my loved one is lost, but God's greater than the problem of a lost relative. You need to, to think about this. You say, my mountain is too high. I just can't get over it. God's greater than that mountain. You say, I don't know what to do or where to go. You need to remember God has all the answers too. The condition of our world is not getting better, it's getting worse, but the cause of Christ is going to go on. Amen? The world may be going downhill, but you know where we're going? We're going uphill. And I thought about this, and I wrote it down. I said, stop and think of all the Lord has brought you through, and look at Him as the champion of your life. I think of where I've been, and what my wife has been through, and our personal lives, and our marriage, and our families. And I think about what God has brought us through, and He's never failed us once. But how often do we forget about what He can do and we try to do it ourselves, just like those sailors did. They thought they could get through the storm, but they couldn't. They needed the master of the sea. And guess what tonight? We do as well. I wonder tonight, is your faith in our God what it should be? Is your faith now like the disciples' faith was when they saw the creator of everything that actually said to the sea, be calm, and it happened? He can do the same thing for you and I. It will just align to work in and through us. Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder tonight, I wonder if there might be one tonight that would say, well, I just don't, I just don't know about that. So maybe you don't know about it because you've never been saved. I wonder tonight if there might be one in here that would say, if I was to die right now, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I don't want to spend eternity in a lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone where the flames never go out. I wonder.